What we experience in the world, we know, is not an absolute reality of the truth of the stimulus. And why, why this is relevant here is that what our brains do, and one of the most critical things for successful navigation in the world, is how we get rid of information, how we perform intelligent data reduction, how context, experience, our priors, influence our brain, influence everything we encounter on a daily basis. For example, I want you all to listen to this video. Ba, ba, Tell me what you hear. Ba, 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 ba. All right, so what does everyone hear in this case? Some uh, nonsense syllable, something that sounded a bit like maybe tha, tha, tha. Is, is there consensus that that's what we, we came up with? Okay, great. I want you to listen to it one more time now. And close your eyes. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, Close ba, your eyes. Ba. Ba, ba, ba. Now that time, what is your experience? A little bit different. Was it ba? Ba, ba, ba. All right. So let's do it one more time. And this time I want you to close and open your eyes, okay? So before I play it, what's going on? This is a perfect example of our sensory systems getting incongruent, conflicting information, doing its best to resolve it, and in fact, getting, producing an illusion, producing an experience that's entirely incorrect. But what our visual system is actually seeing is ga, 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 and what you're actually hearing, which you heard the truth of when you closed your eyes, is ba, ba, ba. But when it comes together, you experience an illusory percept of tha, tha, tha. So it's kind of crazy, but it's based on, obviously, your expectations. If you go to a country where some of the, you know, the, the voice syllables are not the same, you have a different expectation, and this illusion doesn't work very well. It's strongly based on what your priors are going into the experience, and your brain trying, your brain wants as much as possible to come up with a robust, actionable perception of the world and of the information and data that's coming in. So this time, close and open your eyes and see how much control you have over how you experience the sensory world. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. Ba, ba, ba. All right. I like to think of it as, you know, really what our brain is always doing. We're making, you know, context is influencing things such that we get it wrong, but what we're trying to do is get to an actionable, an actionable answer. And in this case, Prior's probabilistic expectation drive our sensory experience. We have a non veridical experience of the world, which means truth to the stimulus is not what we experience. Instead, it's our brain's interpretation. It's what lets us get a void being eaten by the tiger, or find the crying baby in those situations. Here's another illusion that I just want you to take a look at. So if you stare at the blue dot and you see the falling, as you're staring at the blue dot, you should see the falling ball. And it should, does it appear to go straight down? But if you now instead move your foveal vision to where, I want you to look at the ball that's falling, and you'll recognize that it is falling in a straight line. Okay, so this is an example that's actually in, in some ways behind them. I mean, curve balls really do curve, but a lot of batters, I mean, experience what's called a break. And that break is <laughs> often attributed to the idea that, so when you're able to stare at that ball as it's falling, you, there's conflicts of local and global motion. And you're, you know, with the, your foveal and peripheral vision, you can, you, when it's in your foveal vision, you can keep both of those separate. But when that ball is in your peripheral vision, you can no longer separate them. Instead, you're experiencing this, this, these discontinuities and disturbances in the spatial location of the ball, and it experience the illusion. But ultimately, what this means is that everything we go through in, in our navigation of the world has many of these illusions, and it's a matter of identifying and controlling and knowing when they're happening. 
So as a data scientist, what becomes important is to be able to model these experiences. If we can model them and know when they're happening, we can develop you know, how we integrate ba, da, ba, and ga from the auditory and visual world to form a single holistic object requires a weighting that's malleable. And understanding those optimal weightings and when they can m modify and how they influence our sensory information is critical. Information, magnification, and suppression, and dynamic contextual optimization is key. So we can create models of how the brain is solving these problems, but ultimately we want to be able to change it. We want to, the more we understand about them, the more we can build a computational model, the more we can manipulate it and the more malleable it is. Illusions are great. Illusions are great because they tell us a few things. They tell us, one, what matters? What matters in an evolutionary process? What are the key pieces of information? Because having access to all the information is not best. The brain is throwing information away. It's weighting information. It's pulling things out. And how it does that is key to how successful I'm going to be in the world. So knowing that is most important. But now, I want to be able to manipulate it. I want to be able... We also... Illusions tell me where it's malleable. They tell me something about how the system is flexible, and that's beautiful. So enhancing... Thinking about how we can enhance this. In nature, evolutionary processes exist all the time that put pressure on a system and create a dynamic change in the neural processing capabilities that essentially allow species to have what I call you know, sensory superpowers that you would never see in any other place, but let them flourish in a particular prey-predatory environment. You know, if we think about how plasticity for humans can come about, you know, one thing, this is something I, I um, have a course I created at Stanford, it's, it's called Neuroplasticity in Video Gaming. But gaming is this environment that's so controlled and immersive that it allows you to really tap into a lot of different um, capabilities in the physiological system. So you can modify that biological system, you can change the human experience, but by actually changing the neural circuits on a lo very low level. And I'm, you know, people have talked about gaming. There's a lot of gaming, um, immersive gaming for social change, gaming for improving my memory, improving my cognitive skills. But what I'm talking about is on a more low-level, fundamental sensory detection, cap detection task. So let's, you know, for example, in a first-person shooter game, people have shown that my visual acuity, playing a number of hours of one particular you know, game that requires a lot of visual acuity actually changes my detectability of a spatial gradient. Very low-level peripheral processing. Similarly, you can find changes after immersive game playing for multiple hours in detection of different sounds, um, amplification and increased sensitivity to particular sonic regions, or changes in reaction time and grasping to allow faster, you know, lower latencies and faster um, training. All of these are low-level sensory enhancements that can have significant impact and let you get to a point where you now have a system that can have a feedback. You can model the, I, the interactions between the, between the different sensory capabilities, but you can also manipulate them. And so now you need to model your computationally enhanced system, but you know it's flexible. And so it's contextually relevant. So now as you have experience and you can track that, you're able to have a system that's very manipulable. And finally, how can we then take a model, take our understanding of the computational system, computational sensory system, combined with the flexibility and malleability of that system, and turn it into technology that allows us to essentially enhance our biological capabilities? Um, there are a few ways that you know, are, are relevant to me, but there's, I mean, this is a big area. So um, here's an example, and there are different, you know, there, there are some more extreme examples, but this one I like. Um, we have the, I don't know if people have heard of what's called um, high dynamic range um, imaging. High dynamic range imaging, in this case, uh, we were looking, we were using content that was uh, up to about 20,000, uh, it went up to about 8,000 candelas per square meter in terms of its luminance. Uh, it allowed us to play back content that, say, was fire, that when it reached the retina was something that the human system observing it had never seen content that was that high in luminance or fire that was high, that high in luminance outside of a natural environment. 
and when we use thermal imaging, we could actually track content-dependent changes on the individuals just through the technology, you know, through changes in um, the screen luminance that were associated with fire, which suggests when I see flame in nature, my natural expectation, just based on the luminance reaching my, my eye, is for my body to begin expelling heat. My body's reacting just based on the visual change without actually ever feeling any of, that, any of the heat on, on my skin. Why is this relevant to technology, though? It's critical to be able to control how we experience the world, to be able to create and tap into the biological processes as much as we can in these situations. And similarly, to be able to take information and optimally represent it so that we can process as much information as possible in ways that are maximally, uh, maximize a limited capacity of information. So, <clears throat> as I leave you, I want to just say a few things, a few um, summaries. As we enhance our biological capabilities, we can do that through increased environmental awareness, contextual environmental intelligence, having sensory feedback that allows a closed-loop physiological state optimization, and optimized contextually relevant mental states. All of these are technologies and synthesis between technology and biology. And in a complex environment, the more we are able to reduce and intelligently reduce information, the more intelligent our, intelligent our systems will be able to be. Um, finally, <clears throat> never underestimate the power of context. Um, we must, must always have reverence for how context can change and modify our experience of the world very simply. Um, you should all see the... Everyone should be, have seen Necker Cube before. It's a bistable representation. But as you see the box come through the open cube, you'll see the front face go from pointing down to the right to pointing up to the left. Something very simple, but how a simple figure can modify its context from one state to another very quickly. Thank you.